Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Community Conversations. I'm Dr. Jerusalem Rivera-Wilson. I'm in here to greet you and, and inform you of today's topic, getting back to school with the New York State Master Teachers, and to do a formal greeting from the University of Albany, Dean Jason Lane. Great, thank you, Jerry. I'm Jason Lane, Dean of the School of Education at the University of Albany. Thrilled to be with you and uh, delighted that you were able to take some time out of your schedule to be with us today. Back at the beginning of COVID-19, the University of Albany uh, initiated a process to create a website called remoteed.org to provide a wealth of resources for parents and teachers uh, to help them navigate the remote education environment uh, that we're in. There's now over 1,500 resources in that, uh, on that website that have been vetted by our faculty and graduate students, and it's organized by grade level and subject matter. Uh, that draws on the, the great expertise of our university in providing online education. We've been training teachers to uh, teach remotely for more than 20 years, and we've been nationally ranked in the delivery of online education uh, for the last five years. Uh, it is uh, part of that uh, commitment, or part of our commitment to public service also, that we, uh, we built off the website to launch the Remote ED Community Conversations, which you're a part of today. This is our 21st in the series. It's the beginning of uh, COVID-19, and it's hard to believe that we are now approaching uh, this next semester, it feels uh, like almost yesterday in some ways that we uh, pivoted from on uh, in-person to uh, remote education. But I'm delighted that with this 21st offering uh, that we are again with our master teachers, New York State master teachers, the real experts in the field, uh, to talk about what, uh, how we are transitioning to uh, the fall semester, which continues to be, um, um, I think, one that is very much in the making as we are talking about it uh, right now. So before we move on to our, our speaker, speakers, I just want to say invite you uh, to join us again. We do this every Wednesday. It's open to everybody. Uh, the, uh, the focus next week will be on instructional strategies for online teaching uh, and learning, and we'll be looking at research-based strategies uh, around this. So I hope that you'll join us again next week. Uh, but here today, the real uh, uh, experts in the classroom are our master teacher, uh, our master teachers. So uh, let me, or Jerry, should I turn it back to you or turn it back to Rory? I think with this one, I, what I want to say is part of what we're offering uh, is for those teachers who are with us, uh, an opportunity to earn CTLE uh, for being part of the community conversations. If you are interested in earning CTLE for today's session, uh, please reach out to Dr. Uh, Jerry Rivera Wilson, who you heard from earlier. Her, her contact information is here. And of course, uh, if you need it again, she can put that in the chat box as well. So you can uh, earn that, but encourage you to do that. Now, let me turn it over uh, to Dr. Rory Glass, who is the uh, coordinator of the, of the, the uh, Capital Region Chapter of the New York State Master Teacher Program, uh, which is an initi a statewide initiative uh, that brings together uh, some of the best and brightest of our teachers from across the state uh, to work collaboratively with each other uh, and to provide professional development for other teachers in the field. And so we're always delighted to work with our master teachers. Uh, and Dr. Glass, I will turn it over to you. Thank you very much very much, Jason. It's great to be here. And thank you to all of us for joining us today. Um, in an attempt to keep these things topical, uh, we thought that at the end of summer, and I'm sorry to tell you all that it in fact is virtually the end of summer, um, we thought it would be a good idea to look back a little bit at, at what had happened in the spring and talk to some of our master teachers about what they have planned coming here into the fall. Uh, with us today, unfortunately, Melissa, you see there on the top right in her picture, couldn't join us. She had a, a, a sudden legal matter that she had to deal with, and she's not being arrested or anything, so that's the, that's the good news. Um, but we do have our other six master teachers with, with us today for this conversation, and um, we hope it should go really well. Um, Penny, if you want to go to the next slide, I think um, the best way to introduce everyone is to do it through kind of our first discussion question a little bit. Um, there we go. And our first guiding question was really how they manage their remote teaching in the spring and um, were there things that they tried that didn't work, surprises and unexpected challenges. So Connie, if it's okay, we'd, I'd like to start with you. And if you could just talk a little bit about what happened in the spring, any surprises you had, you can tell us where you teach and all of that sort of thing. So Connie, you. Sure. Hi, I'm Connie Wytovich. I teach uh, high school science, um, biology, chemistry, and a college level course um, at Colony Central High School. So to answer this briefly, I would say um, 
Something I tried that did not work and that did surprise me is that I did pre-record my lectures, but if they were like any longer than I would say 12 minutes, the kid, like I could tell when they watched them or if they watched them, they, they, they were not interested. Like if they saw a video that was too long, they just wouldn't watch it. Um, so that was something that I did learn. Um, so keep it short and sweet. Um, and I would say something that I did that definitely worked because for me, I just wanted to make sure that they were engaged and I could track them. So what I did every, every single day, I made a Google form, which was also my attendance tracker for the day. But in my grade book, I made it worth one point. And you would be surprised, like just having something like worth a point, even though it didn't really, it wasn't really worth a point. Um, kids actually did fill that out. So it, it was a win-win because I knew that they were okay. They felt like they got like something out of it. It was something easy for them to just, you know, kind of check a box, but it was, it was a really important thing uh, for them to do. So that's what I have to say. I'll let you go to the next person then, Roy. <laughs> okay, uh, Rachel, how about we turn to you now? Tell us a little bit about your spring and how that worked out. Hi everybody, my name is Rachel Linehan. I teach high school mathematics at Bethlehem Central High School. I have two calculus classes, two um, intro to computer science classes, and one AP computer science. So what really actually worked well for me in the spring was keeping a sense of normalcy for those students because they were preparing for AP exams and for a college final exam for the course. So my structure in the spring was to be as organized and I guess also attainable as possible while the students were home. So I gave them a weekly checklist and I would assign a set amount of problems every week that we would go over in Zoom meetings together. And I tried to just maintain the same type of structure that I kept throughout the year. I gave them to-do lists, I gave them weekly checklists and they were able to stay very organized. Specifically my AP computer science class, I still kept the same weekly activity that we did together in class and we did it over zoom it's called unplugged mondays i just have my students look at a random programming problem that they haven't seen yet and i tell them that i don't have the solution but they have to work in groups so keeping that um, sense of social norm in our classes i think was the biggest help for me um, again they're very motivated because they knew that they had these exams to get through but keeping that organized this set expectation every week was really what worked for me. Um, I did try to make something up on my own for a programming assignment that did not work. So some of the new assignments I made up worked well. And then every once in a while, there was something that I liked the idea of, but trying to engage students in a challenging assignment that is new to them remotely was a big change for me. So I'm going to have to figure out how to address that this fall. Great. Thank you. I think that's something that we'll probably wind up talking more about as this conversation goes on, like as we're trying new things um, that are happening remotely that are unfamiliar with students, because you're going to be dealing with students that you don't necessarily know, that there's going to be a different type of challenge that we're all going to face. And I think we're all going to see a lot of those types of things. Uh, Mark Belden, my friend, are you there? Uh, hi, Rory. Um, thanks for having me on. It's awesome to hear what everybody's uh, going through. So. Um, one of the biggest surprises for me, I'm in, I'm in Scottsdale, New York. Um, we are in Saratoga County and Washington County, and we're pretty rural. So one of the big surprises for me is we've been on iPads and Google Classroom for about six years. And some of my kids that always turn their work in on time with Google Classroom, when we went remote, you know, I had 40, 45 kids that kind of dropped off the radar. So I did a survey right away and found out that some of those kids that were always on time with their Google Classroom didn't actually have internet at home. They were doing all their work during study halls. So like I said, the, the first thing we did was, or I did was push out a survey and find out what kids had. And then from there, we ended up doing a lot of packet stuff. And some things worked really well in packets and some didn't. Um, one of the things that didn't work well, I had put together magnets and washers and I wanted them to be able to do this magnet lab at home. and out of my 260 kids, I'd say like 60 kids really hit a home run with it. And there was a bunch of kids that didn't get anything out of it. So that was a surprise. I thought the hands-on things would, you know, would take off more. Um, 
the biggest unexpected challenge for me was how many kids didn't have internet. So they would be with grandma or grandpa during the day and then mom and dad at night. So they might have internet during the day, but not at night. Um, so going into the fall, that's going to, we've given out about a hundred Wi-Fi hotspots and I think we'll probably, um, probably need some more, but, uh, thanks for having me on. And if you're a STEM teacher, the master teacher program has been awesome for me. I'm going into my third year. It's been a great experience. Thank you, Rory. You're welcome, Mark. And thanks for the plug. We always appreciate it. Um, Stephanie, how about you, my dear? Hi. Um, I teach at Castle which is just south of Albany, I'm in a very small district as well. Um, and I also did the try to keep it as normal as possible. My students were already using Google Classroom, so the switch over to Google Classroom for them wasn't a big surprise. Um, and I took my assignments and I made them goals for the day. So I gave them daily goals. And I also did live teaching with them. And that made a huge difference. And every couple of weeks, I would send out a survey to see what was going on with them. And they really, really enjoyed the fact that there was live teaching and a chance for them to come ask questions. They didn't feel like they were like swimming out there um, trying to finish up a year in chemistry, which is not always the easiest, even when you're in person. Um, and the biggest surprise I had was two things. One was also, as Mark said, the internet. The number of students that didn't have internet um, was very surprising in the beginning. But I have to say, our assistant principal in our middle school um, was amazing. He got internet and um, hotspots for all the families, and they're already ready for this school year. So I think that's going to be one less challenge, hoping that we don't have to experience. And the other bigger challenge I had was I was teaching juniors and seniors. Um, a lot of them were working during the school day. And a lot of times they'd be like, I can't come to class. I can't come get help from you. I'm working, I'm working these hours. Um, and so that was a huge struggle um, and a surprise for me when we were going through the spring. Yeah, yeah. And that, that is a little bit of a surprise. I know I even saw some of that with my undergraduate students where they took jobs during the day, which would have normally been class time and they were really busy all of a sudden. Um, Michelle, how about you? Hi, I'm Michelle Nowak. I teach at Hudson High School. Now, for the spring, we were pretty fortunate that we had already used Google um, Classroom throughout the year and a lot of the remote learning formats like Edpuzzle, Quizlet, um, something new that we were tried were the Google Meets. But our district decided to focus on more of grading with compassion and our fourth quarter did not count towards the overall um, school average. So I was really surprised at the number of students that just kind of disappeared, even though they, they did look for them and find them through um, attendance um, committees, they just kind of tuned out because they had done enough to get them to be successful for the year based on the new equation. And so that, um, that was quite a challenge for us to keep them motivated to come into the Google Meets and continue doing the projects. For me, an unexpected challenge was that although I teach in a urban district, I'm rural, and I just, my Wi-Fi could not keep up with the need of um, trying to record screencastify and to get videos to the students in a timely manner so should I, i'm going to be teaching again remotely this year as well because we have a hybrid program so i'm nervous yeah. i think we've all experienced some of those weird um things with our wi-fi connections i know it seems like Half the meetings I'm on, I'm being told that my connection is unstable, and I think we're all suffering from that in our students, too. Uh, last but not least, Janine, do you want to tell us a little bit about your spring? And we might as well roll you right into that second guiding question, too. So you can tell us some of the things that have happened and then give us some insight into what you're doing for reopening this fall. Sure. Um, hi, I'm Janine Flinton, and I teach in Galway Central School District. I teach um, elementary. so. Um, and evidently, I'm now teaching pre-K this year, so this should be interesting. Um, but I teach Project Lead the Way to pre-K um, to grade six, um, and it's STEM curriculum, all hands-on, collaborative um, curriculum. 
So when we went uh, remote this spring, um, fortunately, our district was moving towards one-to-one -one devices anyway. Um, so it was nice that we already had um, the technology to get to the students. Um, but again, being a rural area, uh, we didn't have uh, Wi-Fi or the uh, infrastructure to get um, Wi-Fi to the students in many areas. Um, so another challenge um, we had was um, that being an elementary school, um, teachers were using technology to varying degrees. I mean, some people had Google Classroom, some had never even utilized it, some rare, you know, just used um, their Google, or uh, um, their technology, you know, for the students to get on and do math practice. So it was a real learning curve for both um, students and teachers. And unfortunately, we didn't have, we went right from a superintendent's um, conference day to closing. So we had no day to interface with the students to try to prepare them or, you know, show them how to use the technology that they were getting. So um, that was kind of a challenge. But um, what really was great about it was how um, through master teachers and through our school district community of teachers, um, everyone kind of shared um, their knowledge and their resources. So um, you know, everybody stepped up and it really made it much easier in the spring once we started those conversations and, got, and were able to share those resources. Um, so um, I think that was one of the challenges. What a great, one great surprise I had, I think, was the students that um, really thrived in that remote environment. Um, some struggled, but those ones that um, kind of surprised me that they did really well in that environment. So. Um, and looking forward um, to that, I think once all of our faculty kind of got on to the same page with, you know, learning how to use Google Classroom and having the kids be on, um, it really made things more seamless and um, we were all able to um, coordinate. Um, the other thing which I'm going to work more towards the fall is um, my curriculum is hands on. So getting the materials to the students and how to have them engaged um, with building things and using those critical thinking skills and problem solving skills um, and not having the materials. So I had to be creative um, about what they had at home. I went to using um, things in nature um, to do the curriculum. So that was another big challenge um, for what I teach. So I'm gonna try to kind of head that off in, for, the, for the fall. <laughs> And um, what is your district's plan for the fall? So we are, um, again, we're a rural school K, uh, pre-K to 12. And um, our pre-K to grade five students will be coming face-to-face uh, -face, uh, for five days a week. Um, we have created um, extra se sections for each grade level so that we would minimize the number of students per classroom. Um, and uh, all specials, except for PE, will be pushing into the classroom. They're going to have lunch in their classrooms. Um, we normally have one bus run for K-12. And so they will, we had to split the bus runs um, in order to get the, the students um, distanced on the bus. And um, our junior, senior high school will be coming um, with a hybrid model. Uh, we split it much like I see Schuylerville did. We split the alphabet A through K and then L through Z. Um, and then we're going to have um, A through K come Monday, Wednesday. The rest of the alphabet will come um, Tuesday, Thursday. We went, so one day teachers will, high schools, our junior, senior high school teachers will be teaching um, an 80 minute, 80 minute block for periods one through four that will go on Monday. And then Tuesday, um, they'll do that again. Then Wednesday, they're gonna teach uh, periods five through eight. Friday is going to be virtual for everyone and kind of a PD day for teachers. Um, and eventually once we get our feet under us, um, they're gonna, our high school is gonna use that Friday to kind of bring uh, students in who might need some RTI um, and things like that. Um, and what we've also done is we've kind of made pods for our junior, senior high school. So um, this 
the seventh grade will be a pod, the eighth grade will be a pod, and then nine through 12, so um, that they're kind of staying within their pods. And um, again, um, we're kind of altering dismissals for grade levels through nine through 12. Um, and that way, um, they're kind of spread out in the hallway. They can only go one way. Um, and that way, if we do have an incident in a certain pod area, then we can kind of contain it to that area. So basically, that's what, what our game plan is. Um, parents will have to fill out a survey prior to coming to school. Temperatures are going to be taken at school um, once they get there. And then, you know, if anything, if there's any red flags, they get sent to the nurse. So. Um, I think I think it's a, a good plan as far as you know how we have kind of have everyone spaced out in our school. Again, we have a small a smaller population of students, so a little bit easier. Great, thank you, um, Stephanie. Do you want to share with us Cat Skills plans a little bit? Sure. So we have a um, phase in plan. So um, we're going back um, in phase or phase one, and that is teacher training for a week and then remote learning until October. And then the second week in October, we'll transition um, to hybrid. So everybody's remote K-12 in the beginning. And then we're gonna go remote and that our um, hybrid and that hybrid model is gonna be phased in. And so they're going to be bringing back um, in kids that need the extra help, like our um, kids that are struggling at home, our special ed kids, um, and then pre-K, K, six and nine. And then everybody eventually will be all hybrid um, through January. And then if all continues to go well, they're hoping to have everybody return in February um, back full time. So our hybrid plan is um, two groups, same way we're splitting alphabetically. So um, the A group would come on Monday and Tuesday, and then Wednesday is everybody virtual, and that gives them ta us time in our rooms and also gives them time to clean the building. And then on Thursday, Friday is the second group comes in. But while those groups are in, the other students will be remote learning um, live with us as well when our classes are going on. So I'll still be teaching all of the kids. I won't just only have half in the room and half online. Great. Um, let's see. How about Michelle? Why don't you tell us a little bit about Hudson's plans coming back? Okay, so Hudson has that first week of school doing PD. And then I know that their elementary is going back um, 100%, but is also staggering the classes that are going to be starting, I think, uh, pre-K and first grade and, and so on. The high school is going to have only ninth and 10th graders in the building. 11th and 12th graders are going to be remote, but the first two days or the first week, I believe, is going to be the ninth graders, and then the following week will be the tenth graders added on. And we have a hybrid schedule, block based, and I believe it's like one through four, five through eight. They're still making the plan up. They have not given us our schedules, but we know that this is somewhat the format that they're going to be using. The issue with, of course, science is a little bit different, is um, the class sizes were. 25 students because they were using larger quad areas so that had the correct spacing. But if we wanted to bring them into our science labs, that wasn't possible based on the square footage. So they're trying to design it so that those classes are going to be split in half so that we have a class of, you know, 10 to 15. So if we can bring them into the science lab, we have that ability. And then of course, Wednesdays, we're, everyone is remote so that they can clean the buildings. Now, we're not at this time doing live streaming of our classes while we teach. So, you know, there's, there's gonna be, they, they may give us some time during our day to teach those that are remote, but we're waiting to see if that schedule, if that's part of our schedule. Great, thanks. Um, Mark, Janine told us a little bit about Schuylerville, but do you want to just tell us what it looks like for you guys? So K through five will be every day. Um, they're encouraging parents to bring their child to school 
to cut down on the number of kids on the buses so they can maintain, you know, their distance on the buses. Um, we're going to use a whole bunch of different entrances to the school based on how the child is transported there. They're checking temperature um, K through 12 for everybody as they come in. K, uh, 6 through 12, A through A through K, you're there Monday, Thursday, and every other Wednesday. Um, opposite end of the alphabet is obviously the other days. When you're not in school, you're supposed to be remote. So when I'm teaching, I'll have a, my laptop will be looking at my Promethean board and whatever I'm, whatever the kids in the room see on the Promethean board is what the kids at home will see. Um, the kids at home cannot see the kids in the room. The kids in the room cannot see the kids at home. And I have to do exactly the same thing for the kids at home that I'm doing for the kids um, in the room, trying to be as fair as possible. So it's an equitable um, situation. So we're still working through um, how that's going to go. Uh, it's a little confusing because Monday and Tuesday and every other Wednesday are A day and then Thursday, Friday and every other Wednesday are B day. So um, for like I have 12 sections of kids in order to get all my 260 kids in. So it's going to be a little tricky. Um, I'm trying to find a big old whiteboard to put up in my room just to try and keep track of of what day it is and who's coming and going. So. Uh, we got a hundred, we got a hundred hotspots to put out. I hope that's enough. Um, I'm not convinced that we won't be remote fairly quickly. Um, when you see what some of the kids are doing, um, you know, outside of the school day, I'm a little worried about that, but, um, that's how Skylerville is, is going to start the year and, and we're going to go from there. Awesome. Thanks, Mark. Um, Rachel, how about you really quickly? Gotta unmute myself. Um, in Bethlehem, we are doing K-6 all in person. Um, we did have enough of the parents of the community to pull out students for fully remote when they were given the option to create a virtual academy, which I believe is going to be staffed by 10 full-time teachers. Um, and that was depending on volunteers, new hires. Um, we had to pull in all of the RTI teachers for math at the elementary level into the classroom teachers to make our um, student ratio go down to be able to fit the students in the room. But the virtual academy is going to be separate from the K-6 classroom. So the K-6 teachers who are in person are only going to have to focus on their kids in school. And then they're going to be assigned teachers focusing on the remote instruction for K-6, which I think is a nice balance. Um, a little less pressure for the K-6 teachers in school. Um, at the middle school level, the sixth grade is being modified a little bit. We had to cut the world language at the sixth grade level to make sure that those sixth grade students can fit in the middle school. Um, and those um, world language teachers are going to be support staff for the other teachers um, on their teams. And then the 712 cohort, we are doing the alpha model as well, A through K and then L through Z. And that was able to keep 90% of the classrooms in the assigned classroom. So there's really only about one out of every 10 classes that has to be physically moved to a larger space. Um, we have the option to do a live stream teach or to design an alternate lesson for the students who are at home on the alternating days. We have a, a day, B day, just every other day. There's no shifting of that schedule. So it's a, B, A, B, A, and then B, A, B, A, or I messed that up, but just A, B, day. <laughs> and we, um, again, are given that flexibility for instructional purposes. However, the students who are at home at the 712 level are expected to sign in and we have to take attendance and collect something back from them if we're not doing a live stream lesson. So we got some flexibility as far as instructional time at the high school. Um, hopefully everybody can make something work with that. That's great, thank you. Um, and we'll wrap this up with Connie. Um, Penny, if you wanna to go to the next slide, Kent, uh, Pen, uh, Connie actually shared her schedule with us so she can talk a little bit about what they're doing in that context. All right, it might be the very next slide because this is my handbook. Is it one it more slide beyond be. this? One? Yeah, it should be one. The next slide to this one should be okay. so uh, the student handbook. There we go. Okay, so at Colony Central High School or at Colony Central High School, 
this is my schedule, but I will say for the district K through six, um, everybody goes full time, priority groups like special ed and um, anyone that needs a little extra, needs to go every day, is going every day. But seven through 12, um, it's this kind of two days a week. So if you look at my, I color coded everything because that's how life makes sense to me. But basically, let's say my period one and two class, let's say that's 24 kids. They will be put into three pods. So I'll have eight kids on day A, eight kids on day B, um, and then I'll have my C group, which will be the, the last of the eight kids. And then it will, the cycle will be, basically repeat. So I will, will be seeing these kids for lab um, and then so on. Um, I will just a little sidebar where I work and where I live are different and where my kids go, the kids, my, all four kids in my household are only going to school two days a week. They're doing virtual three days a week. And that is for kids as young as fourth grade. So I did have to hire some help because my husband and I both work and we don't have grandparents around. And so like, that's like another stressor for me as an individual. But so I'm making this for everyone, for my house, for my school, <laughs> like all this color coding. But this is basically what my day is going to look like. Now, as far as how we deliver instruction, I'm actually going to try to do live streaming because um, within those three pods, I will also have the kids that are all remote. So to be consistent with everybody, that's basically what I have to do. The only days that I think will be a little trippy are the lab days uh, because obviously the kids in front of me will have the priority with, with, the, uh, with the gear, if you will. So that is, that's my schedule. That's what it looks that's like. Good. And if Wait. anyone's interested, I can share this with you. <laughs> Thanks for sharing, Connie. All right, uh, Penny, can you go to the next slide? It should take us back to where we started here. Um, so moving on, so you've heard a lot about, almost everyone has some element of remote distance teaching that's going to be happening. So um, how do you guys think it's going to be different now than it was in the spring, now that it's being planned for, now that it's not just an emergency um, place filler? And Rachel, I think we'll go back and we'll start with you, since you're going to have a little bit of that. And so I think from my perception of my district and the teachers I was working closely with, the hardest part on keeping those students engaged was making sure that we could hold them accountable, whether or not it was for the work that they were turning in, whether or not it was for attendance or participation or grading. So you hate to say that you know, checking off these boxes and putting numbers in the grade book are, you know, a big part of the educational process. Like that's the most important part. It's obviously not, but being able to hold the students accountable on a daily basis and making that connection with your students on a daily basis, I think is really the biggest piece that was missing in the spring um, because there was so much flexibility on what everybody was dealing with. So that's probably the biggest thing going into our plan is trying to come up with the most stable, normal, organized environment and allowing teachers to give grades and push their students through this curriculum, um, what needs to be taught. So I definitely think our district is giving us the tools and supporting us technology wise and organizational organizationally wise, as far as keeping a normal school year going for us and allowing us to kind of come back in the fall and being able to teach what we would have taught last fall without too much of the craziness. But I think a lot of teachers saw in the spring and are now thinking about how can I use the technology to be more effective to get more out of my time when the students are with me in class. So I think just the situation that we went through in the spring has pushed a lot more of our teachers to experiment with how can we make this a better learning environment for our students and not go back to the normal way of teaching lecture style in front of my kids. You know, so that's, it's hard because you don't want to say I need a grade in the grade book to keep kids engaged, but it's definitely going to be way better for everyone having that accountability piece in the fall. Mm -hmm. um, 
Michelle, would you like to talk a little bit about this? Because you did mention accountability when you were talking before, too. Um, so how do you think it's going to look different? Do you think accountability is going to make a big difference in that? Crossing my fingers and hoping that, um, you know, that with the clear expectations and the fact that we're going to tell them, you know, you, this is actually going to count towards your ability to be successful or, you know, to get credit that will have more engagement. Um, it, it, it was a challenge. And so I know that with the experience of going online, you know, there were some strategies that were more successful and that, you know, flipping the classroom is something that I'm going to have to um, be more conscious of doing because although we're on like an AB schedule where we have the, you know, the pods coming in two days a week, it's really, you're only really seeing each class period once a rotation. So I'm technically going to be teaching them remotely four days a week. So um, yeah, so it, it has to be very clear to them that we're expecting them to be engaged in order for them to be successful. But then at the same time, make sure that I'm creating a classroom that allows them the ability to be successful, regardless of the type of student um, that they are, because you know it's it's a big range. Yeah, and it, it counts even kind of like what Connie was talking about before that one point mattered enough to to push students forward. Um, Stephanie, do you want to talk a little bit about how this is going to look different and some accountability from Catskill? Sure. Uh, I think our biggest thing right now is uh, we talked about actually I had a meeting the other day about consistency. Everybody was doing their own thing at their own time. Um, and the students, a lot of students came back and said they just wanted to be, you know, quote unquote normal. And so the biggest thing we're looking for is consistency and accountability. You know, yes, you have to understand that, you know, the grades are counting and this is how they're going to count. And, um, and that everybody's going to try to do a similar plan in terms of keeping it consistent. And so that's why 912 they're having their regular schedule, even though they're remote learning. So if you have class period one, you need to be on period one. And if you have class period two, you're going, you're going to jump right to the next, you know, Google meet. And so that's trying to build that consistency and also making sure teachers in class are doing that. And I tried to do that in the spring and I'm going to take what my students said worked and what didn't work and use that now. Um, I, as I said, I gave little assignments every day and I did count them all and the students wanted to see that. So I'm, I'm doing that same thing where I'm going to give them credit for doing the work. No, oh, that's awesome. Um, in the interest of time, I think um, we'll go right to the next question because it is kind of related when we talk about accountability and some of those students that checked out. And in truth, at least in the conversations I've had, there was a percentage of students that did better when we went remote, and then there were these students that just disappeared entirely. Um, is that a concern? I know we had a community conversation a month or a month and a half ago where we were um, talking to former teachers of the year, and they all had a concern about starting off the new year and building relationship with kids. So is that a concern? at this point, and why don't we start off with uh, Janine? It's like throwing darts at a board here. I just get to pick people, and you, you take that. <laughs> and you go. Um, yeah, sure. I think um, it, it is a concern, and I think the, the important thing to start off with um, is to really find out where those gaps are for those students who uh, may not have been totally engaged um, when we went remotely in the spring. Um, so I think that's going to be um, something that we really have to um, address first. Um, and I think as echoed before, um, I think it will be somewhat better because of the clear expectations that are sent. And also um, because I, I feel like the, the parent communication um, has been improved and the parent knowledge of, you know, how to utilize this technology. So um, for those students who weren't, um, you know, really engaged in this spring. I think that's going to help that parents are more informed as well. Um, and that it's not um, just a, a temporary situation. Um, some concerns I have for some of our students who have chosen to 
um, continue to be virtual. Um, our, uh, unfortunately, some of them who have difficulty attending um, face to face in, you know, when we have normal, um, our normal learning environment. So how to get those students engaged um, and, and to keep them engaged. I, I'm, I'm hoping, um, you know, that now that they're familiar with the technology and that um, we have all these new resources to, to kind of pull them in. I hope I'm hoping that will will increase their engagement in the, in the fall. Yeah. Um, Mark, you had talked specifically about, you know, having some students that just you had no connection with when you first went remote and even students that were normally on top of everything. Um, solving the technology problem, do you think that's going to help that situation and, and have more consistency and get them back on track? I think the number one thing to have more consistency is they have to follow the bell schedule. So because we're putting a routine back in their life, I forgot to mention before, we do have some kids that have chosen remote. Um, I have a, my daughter's going to be a junior, my son's going to be a senior, and they both chose to go remote and they have to follow the bell schedule in high school, just like our remote learners would follow it in the middle school. But I, I think the having internet is going to be huge. But the other thing that's even bigger is the kids need that routine the way, same way we need the routine. Uh, we had a staff meeting today virtually and I asked if we go remote as a teacher, can I still go in and teach from the building just because I want that routine? You know, it's, it's, it's my work, it's my place, it's, you know, it's what I do. So uh, the other concern I have, if, if we're all at home and we're all online, my internet's going to, you know, is going to really struggle. So I'm still worried about remote because all the kids have to be online all the time. And I'm afraid our bandwidth problems will be much worse than in the spring. So I have some concerns about that, um, that we can't handle the infrastructure. It'd be interesting to talk to people in urban areas that if they have enough bandwidth even, you know, to do that. Because if you have, if you have three kids online and a mom and dad online that either work from home or, you know, teaching remote or whatever, that's a ton of bandwidth. So that's my biggest concern is that everybody's going to be online, you know, if we get forced into that model. But uh, yeah. It's, it's been fun. In the spring, it was fun because we had the um, SpaceX launch, and I talk a lot about space stuff. So we actually had some Google Meets when we had the SpaceX launches, and kids that hadn't been involved at all throughout the school year, um, they jumped on for the SpaceX launches. Like Janine, I'm, I'm pretty worried. Um, we have some kids that did not interact at all during the spring, and they have chose to go um, remote, and I'm not sure how you're going to enforce that. But if you have a kid that chose to go remote and does nothing all school year, how do you not hold them back? But yet, you know, how, so there's a lot of questions to be answered. But um, that's where yeah. that's where I'm at personally. Okay, great. Um, Connie, I'm going to go to you to to really deal with question five. So what are you planning on doing different from your normal get the school year launched? Um, this year than you've done in previous years? Sorry, I had to unmute myself. So that's okay. Well, what, what I'm doing that is this, I'm trying to do like as much, as much normal as I can for me, because I have a routine that I use like at the beginning of the school year, but I now basically have like two extra preps that I have to plan for. You know, the hybrid plan, I have the kids in front of me, the kids that are hybrid, who I'll see in two more days. And then I have the kids that are all virtual. So it is just a lot more planning. And to kind of get back to what you were saying, one of the big differences are the expectations for teachers, for teaching, and the expectations for learning. And it is about the consistency, like, which is a good thing. It helps us to compartmentalize our day. Like this is school and work. And then when that's over, you know, we can move on instead of, you know, kids getting messages from their teachers at six o'clock at night and they think they have to do it at six o'clock at night. Like, I think it's, I think it's very good um, for that to happen. But um, I'm just, I'm reading a lot. I am doing a lot of, like tomorrow, all day, I'm doing professional development just to learn new things, to try to, to get some new, new tricks in my bag and, and, and to try it. Like I, the spring was an experiment 
And I feel like the experiment is continuing with some more parameters. Um, but I'm so excited to see the kids. I gotta be honest. I, I like, I don't even care because I'm so excited to see the kids. I can't wait to see them. So just seeing them again, it'll be great. I'm trying to stay positive. Just so you all know, Connie was complaining to me about not getting to see the kids as early as the first week in May. So I'm sure she's very anxious at this point. Um, what about you, Michelle? Is there anything different that you're planning to start off your school year with to get kids engaged in a new routine? Well, um, usually every school year, we really focus on building relationships. Um, and I've been part of the subcommittee with the reopening plan um, with Hudson. And they are focusing a lot on the social emotional like well-being of the students as they're coming back. And they plan on doing surveys. So we do use a lot of mindfulness strategies throughout the year, but I'm gonna make sure that I use those pretty much right away so that they've got some coping skills should things you know should we have to go remote and change everything up but the focus really will be on trying to create relationships with the students in the limited amount of time that we have with them you know in the 70 minute block that i'll have each week seeing them face to face so that they feel comfortable and hopefully motivated to log on during that remote time but um but that is one thing that I, with the mindfulness, I definitely plan on, on using some of their strategies. And they're very, you know, like maybe it's two minutes or maybe it's just something like journaling, but they make a difference throughout the year. There's a lot of growth that happens. Um, I just have to be conscious of doing that much earlier in the school year. Great. Um, Rachel, what about you? Is there anything that you're changing from your normal routine? So my biggest fear about the fall being hybrid and only having a portion of my class in front of me is the communication piece between students. Um, when I started teaching computer science, I quickly realized that me talking in front of the class was not going to teach them anything. The fact that the students could work together and problem solve and have conversations and work in groups and work in partners is really the key to getting them to dive deep into anything that you're teaching. So immediately after I started teaching computer science, I flipped my calculus classroom. So I was flipped for three years before COVID. And my fear is starting the flipped model and teaching these students um, with the mindset that I'm teaching them all remotely, no matter what, if they're in front of me or if they're at home, but to keep that community feeling in my classroom because if you walked into my math classroom in the fall you would see groups of students working together going through homework problems without needing me to be there facilitating that discussion so I'm afraid of losing that piece because that's why flipped classrooms are so effective the kids talk to each other so I'm really going to take it slower and make sure that my kids build the relationships with the students at home and in class um, my computer science kids are going to be partnered with one person in the building and then one person at home for all of their labs. So that way they have to talk to somebody who's not in the classroom um, and really try to do some type of, you know, team building activities with my math classes to get them comfortable shouting over a Google Meet, say, hey, is anybody in the classroom able to help me with number 10? Because I need, I'm stuck. And using those interactive tools online to get them talking to each other and showing off their work. So I'm really going to try to keep it as open and flowy as possible with that live streaming option um, because I think that's my best asset to keep the kids talking to each other. Great. Um, Mark, why don't we move on to the next question with you? Um, you had mentioned the fact that you didn't think we were going to be able to stay live for very long, right? So are you going to do something different to prepare students for that potential disruption? Uh, I don't think so. Um, I don't, cause I don't know what I would do. So I've always run a student centered classroom and I'm really struggling with standing in the front of the room. And I'm sorry, I mentioned Promethean board and some people didn't know what that was. It's like a smart board. It's, it's my screen. So, um, I'm really struggling with teaching at kids. Cause like just follow up what Rachel just said. I, 
you put kids together and awesome things happen. I teach a lot of coding and every year I'll have two or three kids out of 260 that go past where I can code. And I think that's phenomenal, but the way they get there is by working um, together. So I'm not sure how to prepare them better, but just to share what I didn't understand about my students. I had a couple of kids that were just really not engaged at all as, as eighth graders and March uh, 16th and 17th were our first two days remote. And the, on the 17th, um, a mother called school and said that these two kids had run away. So myself and an English teacher and the principal, we spent two days walking all the trails at the national park looking for you know the kids and whatnot. And when they finally found them, um, their home life was so horrible that even though they were in a bad mood at school, they couldn't stand the idea of not going to school because it got them away from what was going on at home. So the biggest thing for remote teaching for me was just trying to find these kids in their happy place, you know, and find out what works for them. We had a lot of mental health issues last winter before this started. So um, the thing that it's really made me think about with our population is trying to figure out, you know, if we can be in school for two or three weeks so I can get to know the kids a little bit, then when I'm remoting with them, if they're not doing, if they're not in a good place, I'll know that. But boy, if you've never met the kid in person and never had him in your classroom, it's really hard to judge when are they doing well and, and when are they not doing well. Um, our school resource officer is a young guy and he's fantastic. The kids love him. And we actually utilized him to check on kids, not because we were worried about their homework, but just because we were worried about them. So I guess I got to know my, um, I got to know my community better through, you know, going through this. I don't know if I answered your question or not, Rory, but that's where I'm headed. Yeah, it was, it, it was close enough. Um, I think I'm going to go right back to you in the interest of time and ask you to address this last question too. So what did this emergency remote teaching change about how you look at teaching the, the population that you teach in your school district? Um, the biggest thing is every bad decision we've ever made about anything magnified itself a hundred times. Um, we use iPads with Google and it's, it's always been bad. Um, and that was even worse during this because normally the kid can give me their iPad and say, Hey, Mr. Belden, that's not working. And you know, I can fix it. So I don't know how many iPads I fixed over the phone, um, because they wouldn't log on to the internet at their new location or, or whatever. So, um, I realized how little we understood about our students and the resources they had at home. That was probably the biggest thing, you know, that I got, cause a kid could be a fantastic kid in school, but once they didn't have the resource provided within our building they really struggled to learn with the resources they had at home. That's great, thank you. Bonnie, what about you? What did this teach you about the way, you, what did this change about the way you look at your teaching? Hmm. I feel like I learned a lot about kids' families. I got to see what they ate. <laughs> like, a lot of kids would like eat freely in front of everybody. That was. That was new for me. Um, I think I just, there was, I think I relearned some things, you know, like that everyone's a human and they have um, stresses and shortcomings and different ways of dealing with stress. Like some kids just dove right into the work and just wanted more just to have a distraction from, from what was going on. And some just were like, hey, <laughs> like, I don't need to do that you know, we're not, you're not there to, you know, to, to make me accountable. And, you know, so there were some kids that took advantage, but um, I, I think what I learned really is that I really like being together. Like I'm a people person and like, I could do this for so long, but I definitely can't do it forever. I was talking to another master teacher over the phone about planning and tech stuff from a different district. And she, she probably put it best. Cause she was like, I feel like, my favorite career that I love was just taken from me. And, you know, that kind of described how I felt too. I was like, yeah, like I, I just, re I, I have relearned how much I love my career. Get me back to those kids. <laughs> I can't wait to see them. That's really awesome. Stephanie, what about you? What did this emergency remote teaching change about how you look at teaching? One of the couple things I learned is definitely be more flexible. 
I've always been a here's our here's our expectations. Here's what we're going to do. You know, I you know hold you accountable. I expect you to be accountable, and I had to learn to let it go and to be more flexible and to adjust to the individual students and what they needed. And the other bigger thing I learned is they may all have cell phones, but they have no idea how to use technology. And um, so my first two days of school this year, I'm actually doing technology lessons. Like here's how to use this. Here's how to do this on your Chromebook. Here's how to you know, open up your Google Classroom. Here's how to take a picture. Like the things that I had to teach them digitally and like, remotely and on the phone and everything was amazing. I never believe, could have believed that they couldn't do this. Yeah. You know, I'm really glad that you shared that because that re really does address some of the things about question six. Like, what do you really need to do to prepare kids to be ready in case you get disrupted again? And it's really to access all that technology because that becomes the gateway to everything else that you're doing, right? Um, and it becomes really tricky. Um, Rachel, what about you? What did this teach you and change in you about the way you look at teaching? Um, I think it actually highlighted that major question we all don't have the answer to is why are we teaching what we're teaching and are we teaching too much and we that could be a whole graduate degree as far as what's in our curriculum. So I think it really, I had to sit down before I decided what to assign my kids, whether it was an AP review question or making an interactive set of notes, what types of videos I was going to include, what types of examples I was going to cover. I had to ask myself, is this a good problem? What does it cover? What, are, what do I really want my students to learn from this? Is it actually interesting? Do they need to learn this in order to move on in the curriculum? So it really made me a lot more critical about what I'm actually giving to my students. And it's finally made me confident to pull back at the amount of homework problems and problem sets that I expect my kids to go through. So it's really made me think about that question, like why am I teaching this and what am I actually going to teach my students that's gonna keep them engaged and something that they're gonna learn and take with them. Well, that's really great. Um, Janine, we'll go to you and then we'll wrap it up with Michelle. Um, I guess one of the um, things that I learned is I always thought I connected well with my students and kind of got this, you know, the beat of my classrooms and um, the kids in there. And I guess one of the things that I really learned was um, for those students who thrived in this remote environment, um, you know, they had a different agenda when they were in class, but to see them thrive and how, you know, kind of that self-esteem that came with that was really great. And also the converse of students that I thought I knew in my classroom who really struggled and who really, I really needed to, um, you know, connect on their um, emotional well-being and, and really be, uh, you know, think about how they were doing in this remote environment as far as, you know, just feeling overwhelmed and stressed and, you know, what was going on at home. Um, so I guess it really made me think about just how well do I know my students and, and really being aware, more aware of that. Um, the other thing I, I guess I learned was um, the curriculum that I do is, is very collaborative and that's a big thing that I missed um, not having the kids all there is seeing what they learn from each other and when they, you know, come up with ideas and one will start, you know, down a train of thought and it will stem and just that collaboration um, and that's one of the things I'm really going to work on you know, if we do go remote um, or have disruptions to make sure that I continue that collaboration in whatever form it may be among the students. So I think that's one of the things I really um, learned. Great, thanks. And Michelle, what did all this teach you? Well, with, regarding the district, um, it was, pretty amazing to see that the district quickly changed the focus from academics to well-being. They made sure that they communicated with us that it was okay to slow down because oftentimes you're pushing through a curriculum. And so it was time to touch base with our, our student body and to make sure that they were okay and then to move ahead again with a lot of compassion. So that was, that was really, that was, you know, telling because when you're focused on getting everybody ready for the Regents, 
when we were making the transition, a lot of us were still trying to stay on that, that pace. And so it was nice that they said, you know, just, just slow down, take care of yourself and take care of your, the kids. And, um, and our population relies on the school building for everything from their meals to wellness, to just the connections in their lives, the, the adults that are stable, you know, for them. So it, it was nice to see that. And, and so the focus again, when we start in September is to make sure that we can as fast as we can make those connections once again, because our community needs that in order to be successful. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And that is, that's really a great thing. I think that we saw a lot of compassion for what our students might be dealing with soon after the, the disruption happened um, across a lot of school districts. And that was really something that was great to see. Um, I want to thank you all for being here. Does anybody have any questions they'd like to pose to the group before we wrap it up? Yes, Dom, and thank you for being here. It's always nice to see you. Um, anyone else? I know I've seen quite a few things have come and gone and been answered in the chat window. Um, I don't think we lost anything. Jerry, do you have anything you'd like to add? No, I would like to thank all of you today. Um, I think the information that you shared was, is extremely helpful. It was uh, interesting to learn um, how each school district is managing um, the new academic year. And I'm sure there'll be continual shifts throughout the, uh, the next academic year. And I applaud, um, applaud you for um, your, your energy, your enthusiasm, um, I know it's going to be a heavy lift this year for all of you, but we appreciate the work that you do and the differences that you are making in the lives of children. So thank you. Thank you, Jerry, for having us. It's always great to come and get to share with everyone. Um, and please don't hesitate to reach out if anyone needs anything. Well, thank, thank you, everyone, and, and uh, be well and enjoy the the weeks, the two weeks that you have before the new start of the, what I always call the new year. And so um, until next week then um, in community conversations, again, thank you to the New York State Master Teachers. Thank you, Rory, for serving as the facilitator. Excellent job. Pleasure. And good night.